as Jonathan said, I'm critic in residence for Art Matters, which is a program that has been funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Uh, tonight's symposium is Writing About Writing, which is the second of six we'll be doing through the end of uh, June. And today's symposium is co-sponsored by the historic uh, Macon Foundation and Crossroads Writers Conference. So we're grateful for that as well. Um, Art Matters has many different parts, but one of them is that we have young journalists who are embedded journalists. We have them going and spending more time than traditional with uh, artists and arts organizations in middle Georgia. And the idea is that with time, they can find ways to write about arts, what's going on here now, what, what's coming, and talk to people and write about arts in a way that comes through different platforms, not just traditional print, but also blogs, Twitter, radio, Facebook, uh, whatever makes sense for the story they're writing or the interview they're doing or the video or audio piece they're doing. Right now we have our media partners include The Telegraph, Georgia Public Broadcasting, Macon Magazine, and BlueIndian.com. And we're always looking for more media partners as we progress with this. Um, I mentioned the six symposia. They are all free and open to the public. We had one already, the visual arts one, last month. Uh, the next will be at Middle, Store, Middle Georgia State College, and it's slated uh, for January 28th, and that one will be on the subject of theater. So we'll have more information about that closer to the date. So now I will just introduce the panelists. Uh, we'll be talking about... Uh, Criticism, the importance of criticism, the way criticism has changed, as well as, in this case, literature, publishing. All of these things have been changing in the past 10, 15 years in the post-traditional media digital age. Uh, and all of our panelists, enormously talented, all have a lot of experience on both sides of that divide. So I'll start alphabetically. First, we have Valerie Boyd <laughs> in the middle, who has the longest uh, little description in the program. You can refer to that as well. She's, <laughs> she's, she's no, the, we're not. We're just, I'm just, I'm just, well, no. But um, she's the author of the award-winning biography, Wrapped in Rainbows, The Life of Zora Neale Hurston. And her latest project is she is curating and editing uh, the journals of uh, native Georgian Alice Walker. Uh, when is that? Pub date? Uh, 2017. 2017. She is also has been a long time, well, she used to be a colleague of mine, an arts editor at the Atlanta Journal of Constitution, but she got wise a long time ago. And she's been teaching as an associate uh, professor at UGA's College of Journalism and Mass Communications, and is the Charlene Hunter Galt Distinguished Writer in Residence, teaching arts journalism and narrative nonfiction. So, welcome. Thank you. Charles McNair, who's the other gentleman on the panel, is uh, a novelist twice over now. His first was in 1994, Land of Goshen, very well received. And then we didn't hear from him for a while. But this September, his second came out, Pickett's Charge. So we should look that up. He has also, since 2005, been book editor for Paste Magazine. So we have some local connections uh, here. Uh, and he also reviews books for Atlanta's WMLB 1690 AM station. So again, he also has experience on both sides of the literary and critical divide. Uh, finally, finally, Teresa Weaver, <laughs> another former <laughs> colleague of mine. She's the book columnist for Atlanta Magazine. And for nearly a decade, she was the book editor for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. If there's anything literary going on in Atlanta, Teresa will usually be there interviewing the very interesting people. Last night, she was on stage with Pat Conroy and survived. So uh, she also is, what's your official, editorial director for Habitat for Humanity International. So she's also a do-gooder on top of all of her talents. So we can hate her for that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all for, for coming. We've already talked about, this is pretty much free form, so I just like to throw out a big, broad question that makes everybody look at me like, are you crazy? Um, so I just want to throw it out there. What, what is the use of criticism these days in the world of literature? I would, I would jump in and say that I think it's more valuable now than it used to be mm -hmm. because of just all the clutter and all the, um, the fact that there's so many people who consider themselves critics 
on Amazon.com and elsewhere, um, that I think it becomes more and more important to have people who really do have the context and the, the um, perspective and the expertise to actually weigh in on books. So I think because there is so much stuff out there, I think it helps to have people who are really focused on it and know what they're talking about. Yeah, I would agree with that. I teach um, an arts criticism class at the University of Georgia, and I'm always surprised that it's a very popular class. I mean, students want to get in the class because even these young journalists want to know how to, you know, to write a, um, a contextualized, well-considered review. And um, you know, they're, they're interested in, in this class. And we start the first day of class with that question. What's the use of criticism? Why are you guys in this class? Why, why are you interested in this? And they talk about the fact that they want to be able to, um, you know, to give their opinion, but in a way that is influential and that is uh, backed up by evidence. And that's what we spend the whole semester doing. And we write book reviews in the class. Their book reviews are due tomorrow, in fact. Uh, but they also write other kinds of reviews just to get a, a broad sense of you know, what it's like to critique uh, television versus books, for instance. Um, they, they even do food reviews. So there's a lot of interest in kind of moving beyond the Amazon.com or Yelp model and really you know, writing with a thoughtfulness and a knowledge base. And I think that's what critics can do, and especially with literature. I mean, I try to get my students to think beyond the thumbs up or thumbs down model but to really kind of talk about this book that you're writing about in, um, in context with the other things you've read, in context with other things that author has written, uh, in context with what's going on in the world right now. And so you know, I find that they really, get, um, they really get into that and into the idea of understanding the difference between you know, what you might do on Amazon or Yelp or you know, even you know, some of the other kinds of sites like that and what you do in a really thoughtful, well-considered review. And I want to personalize that question. Uh, as a fiction writer, um, I tell people that if you want to learn to write fiction, the greatest teacher is putting the seat of your pants in the seat of the chair and writing. It teaches you more to do it than it does to listen to people talk about it or to read criticism. The second best way to learn about writing is to write about writing. Find the great piece that you love um, and, and explain why you love it. Why does it work? Why, why, does it, why did that paragraph right there make you feel? Why did that detonate in your head? And, and when you write critically about those kinds of works, they are so instructive to you, uh, at, to the artist part of you, not just to, to the critic part of you. Val, do you find your, your students have any common misconceptions about what criticism is or what it can be? I mean, do you find? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I ask that question the first day of class, you know, half of the students really, you know, want to learn to do it and are into it and already mm -hmm. are convinced that it's important. And then about half don't really understand what it is or understand um, that it's beyond you know, um, kind of almost uh, PR for the, you know, the artists mm -hmm. or the authors. That's so true. You know, so I think at first there's that misconception. You know, when I tell them, for instance, that you can't write reviews about authors that you know, and you can't, you know, it's not promotion. It's actually reading critically and giving a thoughtful review. And the, the first rule of criticism that I tell my students is be honest. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like it, you know, you can say that, but you can't just say something sucks. You have to say why. And you have to back it up. And that becomes, I think that's sort of the, the biggest uh, ongoing challenge for them throughout the semester is to kind of figure out how to, as you said, you know, kind of why don't you like it or why do you love it? You know, figure out a way to articulate, you know, how you feel about something, and and think of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. You know, for you, Val, and also Charles, you've both had major work that's been out in the public that has gone through the the criticism process. And I had the experience of being a theater critic and then turning 
playwright, so I've been on the other side of the divide, but I'm interested in hearing in what ways your experience on that other side, how it shaped you, or when did you find criticism helpful or surprising in any interesting way? Um, for me, I will tell you flatly that I never read the reviews. Mm -hmm. Never. I, uh, what can I do? If the review is bad, I can't change the book. It's already done and out there. And if it's good, if it falls short of any, at any level of saying that William Shakespeare was the Charles McNair of his time. <laughs> the, that would get the, back to you. <laughs> that would get back. But if it's anything other than that, it's still a little bit, you know, uh, couldn't you have been even nicer in the review or said, <laughs> didn't you notice how hard I tried on these pages? And, and so it really is, a. Uh, uh, to me, you move on. You, you did what you did. You did your best at it. And, and uh, you know, I know the flaws. I already know them. I just wasn't, you know, a, a good enough writer yet to answer the questions that the critics are going to log in. Occasionally I'm surprised, but not often. Well, how do you avoid reading your, you, I mean, don't people send them to you, or don't they go get I, posted on your Facebook page? There's a, lot, there's a lot of word of mouth, but I don't go to Facebook. It is the literary La Brea tar pit. <laughs> if, if you have anything to do in life of use, do not go on to Facebook <laughs> because in two, in two hours you'll still be there and you will not have answered even one of the things you went there to answer in the first place. And so I really don't and I don't tweet. Uh, those things will start up soon for me, but I want to get through the, the book cycle and, and then you know, approach it at a, at a measured pace. And, what do you, I, just, just before you, you answer, what do you tell your friends when you've got a book out there? I mean, it's like, don't, don't tell me? Uh, I just say, yeah. Uh, the ones that would show me, a review, I mean, I run into them. People sure. say, I thought you'd want to see this, and boom, there it is in your face. But I don't actively go out and wait for that review and say, oh, what are they going to say? Oh, what are, right. that, it's deadly. Right. Uh, it's always disappointing, even if it's good. It, 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 you know, it's just not good enough yet. I just want to be better than that. So you don't think you could find any constructive side because that part of you is always just going to go. I think I've I've done the best I could. Right. And I've learned more by doing that best I could than I will learn from what people say to me about the book. And that's not to diminish criticism. It's just, and I think my peculiar individual case, I don't find it instructive. Okay. The, I've had plenty of criticism. They've come, it's come in workshops, it's come person to person. That, that is, so, is invaluable. But as far as having it written by cold strangers out there and sent, and sent to you, uh, I just don't want to see that. I think that's personally. fascinating as a critic. Yeah, see, I, I do too, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I mean, have you ever heard from, from people you've you know, reviewed? They uni universally read the reviews mm -hmm. and universally uh, uh, either contest what I've said or, uh, or send me charming letters about how great and smart I am. <laughs> so everybody else is free to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I recognize the contradiction here. It's just for me personally, I don't learn from the review. And probably there are other writers that don't. Now, when it comes to selling the book, the reviews matter. And that's a good reason to read those reviews, but not for me. I don't disagree with Charles. I mm -hmm. mean, I did read my reviews on the first book, but I don't think I want to read reviews in the future because they weren't that helpful. Um, and I think you're right. You get caught up in that cycle of praise and blame. So if, if somebody loves your book, you, you, know, you get the big ego. If somebody hates it, you want to, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I agree with that, but I think it's hard to do in practice. That's why I wanted to know what your technique is because people do show you the reviews. I know some writers who have somebody read them for them or read them in advance because they don't want to read the negative ones and just get depressed for two weeks or whatever. Just send me the praise. Yeah. yeah. Just send me the so like I might have Charles read my reviews for me and then he tells me, he says, oh, here are the good ones and then I might read those. And, but I think even with the good ones, as you pointed out, that one paragraph that says, well, the book falls short in this one area, that's the paragraph that you're going to fixate on. So it really is, it's challenging to read them because you don't 
get much from that sort of criticism because you're right, you know the flaws in your book. I mean, I teach a narrative journalism class, it's a graduate class, and we read six books of narrative, non, uh, narrative nonfiction. And we have had several of the writers join the class via Skype or in person. And my students are graduate students who are reading these books very carefully. And invariably, when they point out a flaw in the book, the writer says, yes, you, ca you caught me. You got it. Nope. The writer always knows the flaws in his or her own book. Yeah. Oh, I, I would disagree. I think good writers probably know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a distinction. There is a distinction. <laughs> and the problem is, and the, ca the, the catch there is, the, the, the writers who don't know that aren't going to learn anything from criticism. Right. So maybe criticism isn't so helpful generally for the artist. But it's an important thing, I think, for the wider community. It is, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'll jump back in here again. The vital thing about criticism is that it turns up the volume on the art. It makes people engage in dialogue about, about the book or the painting, or the book in this case. And, and that is to keep people interested and chattering away is, is the holy grail. And so if, if you can do that by whatever means, then it's important to, to have it done. You know, what you don't want is a world where nobody re reads or nobody bothers to talk about what they're reading. The more they talk and the more they enter in dialogue and the more arguments there are and, and the more you know, testing of, of, uh, of limits and, and other people's ideas of criticism, the better it is. That is a brilliant segue that reminds me that I forgot to say that one of the overarching main purposes of our program, Art Matters, is to create this dialogue in new ways in the entire community about not just literary arts, but all arts. Finding ways to talk casually uh, about what matters, why art matters. And so that's why I'm glad you're all here. This is exactly what Charles is saying about the importance of criticism. Anyway. Well, I just want to add to, to what Charles just said. I mean, when I talk with my students about criticism, I talk about it as starting a conversation. You know, you don't have to be the last word. You, if you don't like a book, you don't have to stand at the bookstore and block people from buying it. I mean, that's, it. That, that's not the point. You just start a conversation. So, you know, critics are conversation starters, and every author wants that conversation going on about his or her book. But I just think that getting caught up in the criticism itself can be detrimental to an artist's process. Now, Teresa, you've written more reviews than, than I will write in my entire life in, in your career. What are your thoughts about it? It, it has always amazed me at all the authors that I've interviewed. One of the questions I ask them routinely is, do you read reviews? Because I'm fascinated by the process. To a person, I think they all say no, and I believe they all do. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's, I think they're lying. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, not to put you on the spot, but did you read the review that I wrote of your book? I read the profile that you read of me, that okay. you wrote of me. Okay. And I appreciated it very much, and thank you very much. But you didn't say that William Shakespeare was the I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was for space purposes. I didn't have room to say that. <laughs> did, did somebody um, edit that out? Uh, yeah, they must have. Oh, not the editors. They must are. have. Those editors. You can't, you know, you can't get anything past them. But, Teresa, I, I, I think anybody who's been in Atlanta for any amount of time knows they can seek you out and they can trust your voice or know what you like and what you don't like. You started off pointing out that, you know, now we have the whole sort of Yelp approach to review, reviews everybody as a critic. How do people find their way through that now? I think it's very difficult. And, I, and that's not to diminish the role that those reviews play. I, I think they have a part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of the conversation. Um, I think it can be really it's, it's too easy for that to spin out of control and just be noise and that's the part that you have to take into context and the hardest part I, I speak to Valerie's class um, usually every semester when she gets to the book review parts and I think it's the hardest part for the kids to kind of get their head around um, is what can I say in this book review that you know what do I have to bring to it and it's hard to tell them it's your experience. It's where you are in life. It's what you know. It's your context. It's um, you know, but you are. It's one person's opinion. So it's just the better informed that opinion is, 
the better off it is for everybody. But it is, I mean, you got to start somewhere. So this, this one kid in the class at, what was that last week when I was there? Um, one kid was reading a John Grisham novel, which, of course, horrified me to begin with. But um, <laughs> once I got past that initial... Snob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But she was wondering, do I have to, you know, can I just read this one? And I was like, I don't, I don't think it means anything just to read one. For somebody like that, that is a brand, I mean, he is, he is a brand writer. So I think you have to have some kind of concept, context to make she it bailed. worthwhile. I figured she, she would. She chose a different book. Because she, she kind of said, so now I have to read all of his books. And I was like, well, we, I, I would read some of them. I don't yeah. think you can read all... Well, but it comes back to what, Valerie, you were saying about what you tell your students is about honesty. Yeah. Right. And in this case, it's about full disclosure. I think she could have written about that book, but she'd have to say, I'm a newbie. This is right. the first one of these. Right. right. But she would also have to have some context and understand what John Grisham does. Right. And she would have had to do some background. She wouldn't have to read all the books. No, but, but she, she would have, have to know something more. But, yeah, yeah, the point that we made was if she says, this is a great book, somebody finds out something they're not supposed to know, and then they spend the whole book running, I'm like, that's the plot of every one of his books. <laughs> 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 so that was the, you know, uh, that's the point. So if you review that particular book and say, God, this was so exciting, and, you know, the plot was terrific, and I'm like, yeah, he's, he's got that plot down. So <laughs> um, it should be pretty good. Practice, but, practice, practice. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but somebody else in that same class was looking at doing um, J.K. Rowling's new book that is not a Harry Potter book. So it's her first novel that's written after you know this wildly popular series that she did. So I raised the question, or I can't remember if you did, but um, can you read that book and review that, The Casual Vacancy, without referring to Harry Potter or without com somehow comparing it or contrasting it to Harry Potter? I, th I could go either way. I mean, you could either come to it as a brand new reader of this, you know, um, accomplished author and read it as a book and just say, she's known for Harry Potter, but I didn't read any of those. So this is, I'm just reviewing this book. Personally, I think it adds a little deeper meaning to it if you have at least some passing knowledge of the Harry Potter series to say, this is so different from Harry Potter. But it's, this is, it's really powerful because of this. It's and this, this particular student is a big... Harry Potter fan. Right. So she was bringing that context and those expectations. So that's when you have to bring the transparency. Right. And say I'm a big Harry Potter fan and I'm disappointed in right. what she's doing here or whatever. But bringing that transparency, that context, and you know, owning your own biases mm -hmm. is something that I talk with the students a lot about as well. And that's one, one instance where, I mean, most of the time, well, in many traditional forms of journalism and criticism, you keep yourself out of it. But in, the, in, in situations like this, no, you have to have full disclosure. Exactly. Uh, but it's funny because talking about sort of the name brand and everything, it, I was just reminded because of Doris Lessing just dying, the, the stunt she pulled where she tried to get a novel published mm -hmm. under a pseudonym. Yep. Mm -hmm. and couldn't get it done. Mm -hmm. you know. And J.K. Rowling did her mystery, the mm -hmm. second novel she did, not on, well, the second novel she did that wasn't Harry Potter, but under a pseudonym. Right. And it got a respectful review, and nobody bought it until that until was they found out it was her. Right. Yeah, and then now they it's go a crazy. bestseller. And they yeah. go crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but that I think that speaks to kind of the, you know, the power of I mean, obviously branding and names. But I I do tell my students that you know review reviewers have power. Mm -hmm. I mean, a great review in the New York Times can make a you know can make a book, and a terrible review can break a book. And I think you know. That's still true. Mm -hmm. I mean, despite the erosion of uh, book reviews and newspapers, there is still that power, and authors know that. I mean, Absolutely. you know, if you get a book, you know, your book reviewed in the New York Times, and especially if you get anywhere near the cover, I mean, that's a great day in your life, even if it's even if the review is not so great. I've had um, I had a friend whose book was reviewed on the cover of the New York Times, and it was not a not a positive review. And he called me almost in tears about it. And he had a friend who said, I don't, I can't empathize with you. I mean, that friend said, I would like saw my left arm off to, just to get mentioned mm -hmm. in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And so given that, that kind of, when that, he got that perspective, you know, once we kind of talked him down from the ledge, he was very happy with just the attention that the book got because it was on the cover. To back that up, I have a, a writer friend who was badly reviewed in the Times and sold 5,000 books that day. Yeah. 
Just, that's what happens. Just spell my name right. Yeah. <laughs> Please. I mean, when your book gets that kind of review, there's an immediate spike on, on Amazon, and yeah. you know, you definitely sell big numbers of books that, that day and that week. That's right. Even yeah. an unfavorable. Even an unfavorable mm -hmm. review. Huh. In, the, uh, in the sort of atomization of criticism, uh, into smaller and smaller pieces and parts, little bitty megaphones and millions of them uh, that, that critics who are, you people in this room, I, probably all of you have done an Amazon review or, or, or have weighed in <coughs> some way in print, in writing about a book at one time or the other. The important, I, I think that this great fragmentation actually elevates the good critics, the Teresa Weavers, uh, of the world because when, when you are consistent and have a standard that people know that they can depend on, they will rely on you. And I'm no different. I don't read the reviews about my writing, but I voraciously read the reviews that people write of other people's books because I need guidance. I can't read all the books. I have an office. I get, I get 10 or 12 books every day that come to my house, the brown truck pulls up, out comes a, a friendly driver, and the next thing I know I'm lugging in a stack of books this big. It's a great blessing and a great curse in life. You know, you, cannot, you can't review them all. And I look at the mountains of them. I have a New York skyline of books in my office right now. And I read the first page of every one of them. Sometimes I get to t page two and on and on. Those are the ones, the, the ones that are different and that speak. Um, but I have to depend on somebody whose taste comes somewhere close to mine to tell me what is worth picking up and looking through the stack for. And, and then I like to be that guide for other people too. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Paste review model, uh, Paste magazine, where I'm the books editor uh, a little later. But, but any thoughts on, the, on consistency and standards? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I think the, the Amazon, the Yelp, those kind of reviews in any, in any genre, I think they matter. They, they are part of the conversation. I think it's getting harder and harder for critics to make a living being critics. I mean, I, I'm a good example. I don't make a living doing that anymore um, and haven't for coming on seven years now. So I think that, that model is gone. I, I think there are very few newspapers that have book critics anymore on a full-time basis, I think. And that makes the discussion even um, more difficult because this is something we fight all the time. I think in the, in the South and in, well, in any region, there are things that resonate here might not resonate in New York City where most of the literary decisions are being made. So a, a great review in the Times is great. Everybody wants that. But I think a great review in the, in the AJC used to mean something too on a much more regional oh, sure. focused level. And I think that's a shame. And I think every region is struggling with that as more and more newspapers get away from that. And there are fewer magazines even doing book reviews that are longer than about this long. Um, so I think it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get your book noticed. And it, you know, while all this is happening, of course, we haven't even talked about how many books are being published. Mm -hmm. And that's exploded. You know, that's going one direction. And then the number of forums for talking about books is um, you know, <coughs> declining every day. And so serious criticism has a harder and harder time getting to the table in all this. An interesting spin on the old uh, written critique is what's happening in book clubs. I mean, you have little units of critics who get together and talk through uh, a book or uh, uh, you know, some, some other publication, and, and they are doing the critical work. Um, they're just doing it privately in their homes with nice wine and some cheese. So what does that mean for authors? I mean, I know a lot of authors who are, and publishers, as you know, who are paying more attention to book clubs and sending authors in to talk directly with, you know, with their readers in book clubs. So do you think that's because, like, criticism is moving more into the wine and cheese and into the parlor? I don't want to give a hasty answer because I haven't really thought through what I might say about that. But, but uh, I never pass up a chance to go to a book club, mm -hmm. ever. You guys, anybody in the book club? Here, here I am, half, <coughs> half wheels will travel. Uh, 
because I, you want to be face to face with the, the audience. That, that's how you build up people who love what you do and love you and, and will come back and, and buy your books. So it's interesting, I mean, with the internet, the digital explosion where we're able to be in touch with everybody in the world, theoretically, you're saying in a way that in the literary world, it's necessary to go against that, to actually get traction. It's to do both. You have to do both. Yeah. To do yeah. both. You know, it's the Irish dialectic. For Irish people, it's not either or, it's right. either and. Mm -hmm. that, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that you have to do both because I think I mean, Teresa was talking about, you know, how a, a great review in the AJC used to really mean something regionally, and the AJC has moved away from doing that kind of criticism. But I think with, um, with Facebook and Twitter and those sorts of social media outlets, I think a good review does get posted and shared, and it doesn't matter what publication it was in, mm -hmm. because people are just going to read it online. But good, thoughtful reviews, whether they're positive or negative, do get a lot of um, shares on Facebook and Twitter, and they sort of go viral. So I think critics you know, still have a voice in the social media world, and in a way, it, it becomes bigger. Because if it were just a review in the AJC, if you were outside of Atlanta before you know, the explosion of social media, you, would, you might not see that review. Mm -hmm. Now you see it no matter where it is. But it's just harder to quantify. Mm -hmm. you, you just don't know what's going to go viral or Exactly. What's not. You can't predict it. Right. And it is, you know, fractured, as uh, Charles mentioned. It's mm -hmm. all very fractured. So, yeah. And the shelf life of these things. I mean, books come and go. It's like movies now. I mean, every weekend right. there's so many movies out, you can't keep up. Right. And then the next weekend there's a new crop of movies out. And books, there's, there's a very small window of opportunity to get reviewed. Um, and if you miss that window, you're kind of screwed. So when my uh, book came out, um, and you probably, your book just more recently came out, so you might uh, have ha experienced this, but my, I was with Simon & Schuster, so it's a big publisher, and they give you a publicist. I mean, you know, you, they've invested some money in your book, but that publicist gave me exactly three weeks and she was dedicated to me for three weeks and would answer my calls for those three weeks. But the moment the three weeks were up, it's like, you're on your own, kid. Yeah, and they move on to the next book. And that's probably gotten worse. I'm sure, yeah. I mean, what year was that your book was that? That was 10 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, now it's probably, you know, a week. Yeah. Um, I will, let me talk about an interesting sort of hybrid uh, critical model that um, I have done as an experiment for the past year at Paste Magazine. Um, I have taken, I have not assigned more than three or four reviews of books that I think should be read in this past year. Instead, I have taken pitches from writers and readers out in the general Paste audience whom I trust these are smart people, they're smart readers, and just like Yelp, they want to say things about certain books that they see or come across. So they pitch those ideas to me, and I, you know, I'll come home from a trip and have 400 emails. And uh, um, I go through these and uh, apply a little bit of adult supervision and find the writers with the, the books that sound the most interesting and the writers that sound the mo have written the most interesting pitches to me so that I know that they can write, I know that they can think, and then I say, all right, let's hear what you have to say about this book. And they write a review and send it in to me, and then as a true editor, uh, a line editor, I work with these drafts. Sometimes the thinking is really good, but the... the uh, the way they're written is not really good. And so I help buff them up and uh, improve the writing of the pieces and, and help the logic flow. And I'll do two or three drafts back and forth with these writers. And the reviews are long. They, I got a 2,500 word review in uh, just today. And, and they, uh, you know, they, they're thoughtful and deep. And it's an example of a vox populi uh, model where the people speak, the people send me, you know, it's to, it, it's the same world that Amazon and Yelp uh, uh, it, it has turned into, 
but with adult supervision so that I can channel the raw or the, the sort of unformed thinking into something valuable for other readers. And the thing valuable to me is, again, I can't know every book. This audience knows more than I do about a lot of things, and, and especially about the hip, upcoming, fast rising writers. And I keep learning these things. And, and you know, I'll get this good pitch, I'll look it up. Yeah, well, that sounds just like the magazine. And we'll run it. So, out of the 400 um, pitches you might get, how many do you publish? Uh, there are two a week. That's all we get. That's all we get. And so I wish I could do one every weekday. I've been talking to our editor there about doing, having a nice, solid uh, book review every single day in the magazine. I hope that can happen. So in a way, it sounds to me like your, part of your process in the editing process is, is helping or teaching these people to think critically, to be critics, which sounds to me like, Valerie, what you do with your students. So I mean, what is the advantage of that? Well, I think the advantage of it is, um, you know, most of my students aren't going to go out and be professional critics, mm -hmm. um, especially given the, you know, scarcity of jobs in that, in that realm. Though I have had some students, I had one student who uh, started a, um, based on what we did in class, he ended up starting a um, food blog in Brunswick, Georgia, where he's from, and it's a food reviewing blog. So it's gotten really popular, they get good advertising. So. Some students do move on to careers as professional critics. But I think just critical thinking, thinking critically, being able to, um, you know, we all are critics. I tell my students, you know, you criticize the drivers when you were on your way here today. You know, you, you're criticizing all the time. You know, you criticize your latte, too much foam, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. You, we're critics all the time, but to kind of stop and think critically means really being able to articulate the whys of your preferences. You know, why do you like this? Why do you dislike that? So being able to, to articulate those things is a valuable skill that mm -hmm. students can use no matter what they end up doing career-wise. One thing that's come up with this program, with the previous symposium, is you know, when you talk about active criticism, uh, in Atlanta it's one thing, in New York it's another thing, in a smaller community like Macon or Middle Georgia, I think it's, it's more of an issue about how do you speak or write critically in a way that is honest and that is constructive that doesn't hurt people's feelings. You know, I think people maybe are afraid that they're going to be mean or well, something. Well, I think so, your, your key word is constructive. Yes. You know, when I first started teaching this criticism class at UGA, I had a professional artist come in and talk to the students about how she feels when she reads a review of her work. And she talked about getting a negative review once and not getting out of bed for a week. And the students were just devastated by that. Like they were, it made them afraid to really be honest. So we had to really kind of talk through that and recognize that there's a real person behind that book or that artwork that you're criticizing. And nobody sets out to write a jacked up book. You know, everybody sets out <laughs> and tries to do their best. So you need to be a human being and you need to be compassionate. But there's a way to do that while still being honest and being constructive and making a few suggestions here or there. I mean, that's kind of the way to do it. And I think for some writers, the best thing to do, writers and other artists, is to protect yourself and not read reviews, as Charles does. The, um, what you're saying about the, the um, I think that it's important for um, the pure humanity of being a critic to consider that all of those books in that mountain on my desk and on your desk and Teresa on your desk, those are years of someone's life. And, and not only that, even more important, those are dreams, the dreams that they harbor the deepest and that they work the hardest on in their whole lives are right there. And they're giving that to you and saying, help me. And some of them are horrible. Horrible. <laughs> and that's the reality. And there, I mean, there's some crap out there that should never have been published. And we all know that. Yeah. I think the best way to handle those is not to review them. 
Why um, waste your time? Right. right. I mean, Why with, with limited space at the AJC all those years, I mean, we gave, there were very few reviews that were just absolute pans. Um, and those were because an editor had told me to write about the book, and I had no choice. But I, I always thought, you don't beat up on first novelists. There's no reason to, you know, to disembowel somebody for writing a really bad first novel. That doesn't serve any purpose. Um, and I think it, it, it's, it's not even fun. I, I, the, the few really bad reviews, the really negative reviews that I had to write <sighs> over you know, a nine-year period, I wrote three that were that I would consider just pans, and they were all forced on me. And they weren't fun. It was, you know, you think when you read them, wow, that's you get to have a lot of fun with that. It's not fun. Yes, it's not. And even if you write, one of them was about who moved my cheese. You know, <laughs> something. So I wasn't worried about hurting that person's feelings because they were making millions and millions of dollars on this horrible book um, <laughs> that was being reprinted. It was a new issue coming out, and that's why. Uh, and I was working, uh, we were in the editorial section at the time, the book reviews ran in editorial and the, you know, the editor thought it would be funny to write about why is this book still selling after, it, I think it had been out 20 years and they were putting this new issue and I'm like, who hasn't read that book that would read it and what in the world is in it? And I read it was even more horrified than I thought I would be <laughs> and wrote about it and that was kind of fun. I mean, that was the closest to fun because that was so removed. It wasn't an Atlanta author. It wasn't somebody I was going to run into at a literary event. And my desk um, was near yours and oh, the noises, the noises. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we haven't talked about something that's, that's really burning, I think maybe this is a good time to open it up for questions. Sure. Bring it on. And, and please wait, Jonathan will bring a microphone to you. And you don't have to ask about criticism. I'm sure some people would like to know about other works. And um, you guys talked about the importance of uh, context when you are reviewing a book. And I had recently gone down to Eatonton and saw um, the Brer Rabbit Museum. And, and it made me think about um, novels that were written in a time that certain things wouldn't be considered bad, but now we're looking at them now and they are considered racist or sexist or misogynistic. What, as a, a critic, is your responsibility in reviewing something like that, that has been written in a different time with different characters with different mindset? I guess I'm not sure why you'd be reviewing that to begin with, unless you're mentioning that in something that you're writing now. Right, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think again, it, it's transparency and honesty in saying that by today's standards, you find this really offensive. And um, but when it was written, it was a different time. I, I think as long as you're open and honest about it, mm -hmm. and give the historical context, of right? It, you know, and how it was received at that time, right? Um, Which is often tremendously valuable service mm -hmm. as a critic that yeah. you can you can tell people why it did offend, or, or why it didn't in those days. start out with, they, uh, all they concentrate on are the first two pages and they catch you, but then there's nothing in the end. Um, <laughs> and I feel sorry for those books that don't catch you and are really good the rest, you know, for all the rest of the pages. I'll say that you generally can tell. Okay. There's a shining in a, in a certain writing and that is unescapable. If, there, if, if the writer has substance and, and believes in what he or she is writing, you sense it. There's just something in there that goes deeper than the words. And I, I liken it to a trance. If I'm reading and I am not out of this world and immersed in the fictive world within those few lines, it's, it's a tr true acid test. I, I mean, it, there's a thin veil between, the Irish talk about thin places where the spirit world intervenes into the real world. And it's like that with fiction. You're either in that world or you're not in it. And it doesn't take long to find out and have the, the spell cast over you. And that's what every fiction writer tries as hard as possible to do. Uh, but there are books that just 
you never believe it. You never, ever, ever suspend the disbelief. It's just words on the page. And you know, writers never want to hear the odds that are against them. You kind of know, you know, at a distance that reviewers get a lot of books. When I was at the AJC, when I left there, I was getting 200 books a day. I mean, that's the volume of what you're up against. And think of what the Times must get. They must get five times that. And they, of course, have a bigger staff to deal with it. But you have to make, it, it's triage, you know, it's every day. And it's looking at things and trying to keep them moving. And, well, that cover looks interesting. Let me open that book. But it, it really is. I'm sure that you miss good things that way. There's no doubt in my mind. But I think Charles is right. I think when you open a book, you read the first page, and you, you kind of get a feeling that this is either worth continuing to read or it's not. And you only covered books that had pictures. Right, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rest were too hard. Some weren't even colored in. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But it is, it's horrifying to think that you could just be having a bad day and be rushed and you know miss uh, just an incredibly good book, but it happens all the time. And I, had, I had that experience when I was uh, you know, covering, well, I still cover film, but uh, there have been some movies I've seen and written about and it was like, eh! And circumstances happen later, a couple of years, I see it again, I'm like, wow, I missed that. <laughs> There's no science. It's, it's, yeah. it's a real crapshoot. And the volume is just, it's overwhelming. But Charles, you talked about using reviews also to be your guides. So do you look at other reviewers? If, if you've passed on a book and another critic likes it, you'll, go, you'll give it a second look? Absolutely right. I'll say, you know, I'm fallible. I admit it here. I'm, I'm, I'm They're fallible. recording, Charles. They're recorded. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Uh, yes, I'm fallible. I will miss things. And, and I also, in f maybe five months or six months, I'm alert in a new way to some issue or, or thing. One valuable uh, thing that I think paste criticism does is uh, we, I tell our reviewers uh, in, in whatever first exchange we have, you are not writing a book report. You are writing an essay about the culture that we live in, and this book that, we're, that you're reviewing is a, is a lens onto that issue or this subject or this topic. And, and so, you know, it encourages them to go broad with their thinking and, and to try not to just relate the facts of the book. And, uh, and sometimes those cultural things come out of the mist in a short time after you've looked at a book and you said, wow, I should have gotten that. I just totally, uh, you know, I was asleep at the, at the switch. It happens. And I've also, I've heard on NPR, there'll be an interview with an author and I think, wow, that sounds more interesting than that book looks. All the time. So you go yeah. back and you look at it again. Which is another great value of, you know, having many uh, critical voices yeah. out there. Sure. Uh, I had two questions. Um, one is about uh, the critic's responsibility to the culture, which you sort of just mentioned. Um, there is a, I remember being in grad school and reading book reviews in Harper's and the Atlantic by, by Guy Davenport, by Hugh Kenner, by these sort of towering, uh, well, they're professors, but they were also excellent critics. And uh, the nature of their reviews took people back into the past. In some ways, they always kind of conserved culture. Uh, they were always reaching back, even as they engaged a new text or a new book. And it seems to me that these days, um, criticism is more and more focused on handling that 200 book a day, yeah. uh, th just just the uh, that turbine of pages that's turning out all the time. And we're losing our sense of criticism as a conservator of the culture, as a as a as a, a facility for saying what's worth keeping, and also for connecting what's new with what's already been. And I wondered what you all thought about that. Do you think about that often as critics, about filling that kind of role? Where are we in, in that sense? I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think a lot of it is space. I mean, it comes down to the space devoted in publications, whether they're online or print, to reviews and to literary essays and, and bigger things than reviews. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to justify that kind of space in any publication anymore because advertisers don't, they don't pay to be there. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tough battle to be fighting. You look like you wanted to say something. The last two reviews that I personally wrote uh, and went in paste, not this last Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, 
were uh, two reviews in the same issue. Uh, one was Trout Fishing in America, written in the 1960s, and the other was Grindle uh, in the 1970s, that great John Gardner book. And, and the reason that I do this is exactly what you're pointing out. How many kids right now who are reading Paste know about those books? And, and I consider it a duty of, of the critic to remind them of what some other great or notable, I'm not saying Trout Fishing is a great book, but it's a book that you ought to know about. If you're a serious reader and, and if you're plugged into to our culture in any way, that ought to be part of your cultural landscape. And so, it, you know, at least online, we can, we can do a little bit more than, than print and advertorial uh, things. So do you have space limitations online? Teresa was just talking about space. So you can run a 2,500 word review? How big is infinity? Well, <laughs> but here's, here's the problem with online, I and mean, we fight this all the time. Yes, space is absolutely unlimited. You could write you know, eternally, but the attention span is about this long. That's and it. that's the reality. So this, the space that you can use to go on and on and on about something, nobody will read it. So is that a good use of that space? The latest statistic is reader online, click, up it comes. You have exactly six seconds yep. to capture those eyeballs. That's it. So you better write a good headline. You better, if you have the color red and can put the color red at the top, that works. Uh, it, it, it's, I'm not kidding about this. It, it is, you know, that lead sentence, the, the topic, the, the subject you pick, uh, never more important. But you have to continue to have faith that there are and always will be the mm -hmm. people who will read Absolutely. the 2,500 words. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because... That's why we do it. Yeah, Charles, what you were saying, you know, about talking about doing a Brodigan book and Gardner, uh, it, it's like until the last 20 years, there still was like the mountain of dead white men, uh, all the authors that everyone knew. And a lot of those, it's good they're going away or the people don't know about them, but I find that younger people know so little about you know, what I always considered were texts that everybody would know that were from the past centuries. So that is part, I think, of the conservator imperative, I think, of the critic. I teach up at Mercer, and what I'm finding is that young people want to keep reading in college what they've already read. Hmm. The young adult novel that that they've you know they want the class in Harry Potter, they want the class in Jonathan Green, and I'm not knocking Rowling or or Green either one. They got a whole generation reading uh, Rowling, Thank you. but there's this sense that uh, of a kind of arrested adolescence of hmm. taste. And a lot of the New York Times bestsellers these days are, are specifically YA novels, which can only go so far, you know, in what they can offer. They don't have the depth of a Grendel. They don't have the depth of a, uh, of a Brodigan. And we're just getting, seems like we're getting dumber and dumber as a culture. And we're choosing to do that. Uh, well, it, it's definitely, it's a generational thing that you see. It's about instant gratification. It's, I mean, there's so many things involved in this. And it's about, you know, how we can keep forcing these vegetables on people, but if they're not going to eat them, you know, and how do we kind of bridge that divide? And I've always said, if J.K. Rowling never does anything else in her life, she's done a tremendous thing getting little boys to read fiction. And that just, that has changed that landscape entirely. But, yeah, what do they read next? And the trick is finding that next book or that next series that's going to excite, you know, those little eight-year-old boys to keep reading and to, and to want to read more challenging things as they get older. It's, it's not easy to, you know, to even articulate what we should be doing as opposed to what we are doing. A lot of what you're seeing is turning, uh, there has been a landmark moment uh, as of Labor Day, really. Uh, John Lewis came with his uh, graphic novel, uh, March, and he came to the Decatur Book Festival and had lines from here forever. Um, and there have been other graphic novels that sold well, but I don't think there's been a phenomenon like that, which suddenly made the graphic novel as legitimate a reading form as YA has been. And, and I, you know, I, I do believe that that book is a transforming book for, for that medium. 
Now, my question, I learned to read out of comic books. I really, truly did. The Marvel comics, you are looking at a writer who, who uh, has a great debt to those old, old things. Um, I'm not sure that I would think of it as dumbing down. Uh, I mean you no know, dis disrespect, but I'm just happy if people are reading. Really, a good book, we talked about Grisham, a good book is when your eye gets to the bottom of that page and you take that page and flip it like that and start reading on the next page. And there are lots of good books and lots of tastes for different kinds of books. And what we have to recognize as critics, I think, is that th there is a huge variety of tastes and imperatives and reasons to read and satisfactions and pleasures. And the more of it that's out there, the better it is. It's, I, I don't see that this YA uh, incursion is a huge threat long term. If it makes people love reading, they're going to find something to read and keep reading. They, I really do think that. I agree, and I think they will make that leap. I mean, I teach, you know, students probably the same age as the ones who teach at Mercer, and I have seen that too. I mean, when, when they get to do their book reviews, they choose the book, and I give them some parameters, but they get to make the choice of what book they want to review. And some of them do gravitate toward young adult uh, novels, but the students I teach are usually seniors, and they are, I think, our young people are afraid to become adults because of the economy and all sorts of things. So I see them really resisting kind of graduation and the next step to adulthood. So I think the gravitation toward young adult novels is just kind of a desperate attempt to hold on to, you know, to still being a kid. That's really perceptive. Yeah, and they're 21, 22 years old. We talk about this. I, talk to, I tell them, talk about your fears. You know, they're afraid that they have to go out and get a job. I mean, they're afraid of that, but some of them use this opportunity in a class like this where they get to choose everything they review. They get to choose the book, they get to choose the restaurant. I mean, some students want to review Chick-fil-A, you know? They want to still be a kid. Yeah. Um, and, but others choose, you know, they, they use the opportunity to kind of step more fully into adulthood and maybe read a book that they would never read before. You know, I had a, a student once read a big 700-page John Irving novel, and she was just flummoxed by it. But <laughs> it was great that she said, I'm going to go for this, you know? Um, so I think what you're perceiving is kind of part of a larger issue among people of that generation, and sort of being afraid to take that first big step into adulthood. And the young adult novels provide a kind of comfort for them. Uh, but I agree with Charles, eventually they will take that step, and at least we've created readers now, so they, they will eventually read something else. I say let them have the, the pacifier as long as they want. If they knew how hard it was to, to be grown up, they'd all be jumping off bridges. Well, that's why um, they're afraid. They're afraid I, I, to Absolutely that. right. Yeah. I, I guess they're more hopeful than I am that, that they will take that next step mm -hmm. and do something more challenging. I have a two-part question. Um, one for you personally, what makes a great critic? I mean, obviously, this, everyone can be a critic, like you said. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, you've been recognized by a certain publication as their critic. It's the title thing. And then second, um, who are some of your favorite critics that you go to? You were saying somebody, you, you'll, somebody will review something and you'll go back to it, maybe. Who are those people that can make you look twice at a book? You want to start with me? Um, I think what makes a good critic is just it's a voice and it's a, a writing style. Um, that's first, and then you kind of, as you develop the relationship, you come to expect, you know, that you know that your taste is a lot like this person, so you go back and back to them, like I want to know what this person thinks. There, there are several um, book critics who still exist around the country that. Um, that I think the world of that I respect a lot. Donna Seaman, who writes for Library Journal, which is a, it's a trade publication, so critics see that. They see, and there are a lot of little capsule reviews, but she also does a lot of reviewing for the Chicago Tribune. Um, and she does a radio show in, in Chicago, too, interviewing authors. But her voice, I've always just found to be really, I love the way she thinks, and, I, and she writes some really long pieces that I find just fascinating. 
Um, beyond that, Gail Caldwell at the um, Boston Globe, I think is terrific and has been for years and years. Um, i trying to think of others that I... Well, I like Donna Seaman also because she also writes some very short reviews right. that kind gamut. of cut to the chase and really kind of give you a sense of what this book is, but also, you know, I feel like over the years of reading her, I've kind of gotten to know her taste, and I know where my taste and her taste intersect. And I think that's what's important for, you know, uh, and I tell my students that that's what's important for reading critics, to kind of read some critics consistently so you know, like if you tend to agree with Roger Ebert's reviews, then you go to his reviews. And, you know, if you tend to agree with Steve Murray's film reviews, you go to his reviews. I mean. So kind of finding where your taste intersects with um, those of the critics you read. Um, in terms of what makes a good critic, I would agree that it's, it's voice. And it's also, for me, it's the attitude of starting a conversation and not trying to be the be all and end all. I don't need anybody to tell me what to think, but you can tell me what to think about. Yeah. So point out this book to me or this restaurant to me or whatever and make me think about it, and, but trust me to have my own um, you know, intelligence and bring my own perspective to it. Um, but I like critics who are about starting a conversation, not ending a conversation. And I like critics who teach me things that I didn't know when they're talking about books. And there are, uh, there are there's a lot I don't know. My, they're smoldering gaps due mainly to the 1960s. In, 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 my, in my reading and my, my memory. And uh, it, people that fill those blanks in for me and, and also who give that context you were talking about, here is why this book was important when it was. Bingo. I got it. That's what a good critic does for me. And uh, I like, uh, who's, the, who's the time critic? Um, Lev Grossman? Lev Grossman. I like Lev and uh, admire him and I give him great credibility because he writes fiction too and writes it uh, pretty darn well. And because he plays the game, he, I trust when he makes observations about the game. Uh, and uh, I also like the New Yorker. I, li I like those, those critics who write the book reviews in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of those aren't like straight up reviews. I mean, they're more right. what you were talking about, like critical essays where exactly. right. they're engaging with the book, but also kind of engaging with the larger cultural Telling issues. you why this book matters yeah. right now or doesn't matter right now. Right. Well, I have one question. Um, I know you talked a lot about um, the amount of books that you get in. And we, had a symposium earlier that was about visual art. And so people were really limited because they had to physically be in the presence of the art to be able to review it. So they were limited by distance. But with books, you're not limited by um, the distance from where the author lives and things like that. And um, online, I think people tend to sort of create regionalism based on shared interests versus where they live, like sort of geography. So is Anything like that happening in book criticism where people are focusing and saying, I'm a book critic for this genre versus just a general book critic? Is there any sort of happenings in the field along those lines? It's an interesting question. I think it's probably been happening for years now. I mean, ever since online made it a lot easier to, to follow critics everywhere and to kind of find what you want to read about. Um, in my particular case, I'm limited because of we're still very geographic as far as they want me to write about Georgia writers in Atlanta magazine so I it doesn't matter how far I want to look I have to kind of focus real tightly um, it, it's an interesting question though and it probably makes some sense but again the the nature of publications even online they you know the AJC even is going more and more local you know, is that, mm -hmm. don't you think that's true? Where they're Absolutely. looking more and more at local authors and wanting to write about local books, even though kind of instinctively it seems like we should be opening up the conversation a lot wider. But I don't think that's what most publications are doing. I would think that like most newspapers I, uh, um, would be focusing more local because they can't compete on the topical level because they're right. sort of a 
geographically based audience. Right. But online, like if you're a publication that's just started, you can your audience is whoever happens to come to your website. So you, yeah. it's easier to become a niche from the beginning than for a traditional media to become a niche publication. While they're calling it AJ City and Atlanta Journal Constitution. Yep, and those groups have always existed, like the romance writers, mm -hmm. you know, of America. It's a hotbed in Atlanta. I mean, that's always been kind of the ground zero for them. But that's a very, that is a very active community of writers and readers. And critics. There, yep. you know, there are websites devoted to criticism of just romance novels or just yeah. mystery novels. So I think there are some genre-specific kinds of critics. But I mean, you know, most of us probably read pretty broadly, you know. Mm -hmm. We read fiction, we read nonfiction. I mean, we read according to our interests, but our interests, you know, are fairly broad. So I think most publications that deal with book reviews try to kind of get at a little bit of everything because it's all part of the cultural conversation, right? So the conversation isn't just on one topic. I feel much more comfortable uh, in uh, my tribe of fiction writers as a critic than I do wandering out into areas of expertise uh, in science or in other areas. But I still love those books and I can tell you whether one is well written, well argued, uh, or, or, and, and important, uh, even though I don't do that. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, we sat here and listened to what makes good criticism, but from a personal standpoint of each of you, outside of Charles wanting to be Shakespeare, what would be your favorite work of either fiction, nonfiction, and why wow. for each of you? <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, okay, thanks very much, y'all. Um, no, Got a plane to catch. You've been great, really. Uh, <laughs> Teresa, remember my book? <laughs> um, wow, that, I mean, it, that changes on a regular basis. I can't say that there's one. There, the first book that I remember reading as, um, you know, I was a child, but it was the first grown-up book I read was To Kill a Mockingbird, so that will always have a special place in my heart just because that, that you know, where that was set was so much like where I grew up and it, that just resonated with me in a way I always wanted to be Scout you know. What was your cat's name? Scout. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this, so that book will always be special to me um, and, and I, I have favorite authors that I go to all the time you know and go back to and there are books that I read at particular times in my life that meant something. But I, there's no way I could come up with just one, my favorite book. The first book that I bought with my own money when I was 16 was uh, Sula by Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had discovered Toni Morrison. <laughs> I thought, wow, I've discovered this great writer. Nobody knows about her. <laughs> and it was only later that I realized that, you know, she was a celebrated, you know, one of the most celebrated writers in America, which actually came later. I mean, when I discovered that book, it was um, in 1979 or so, soon after it was first published. Um, and she became celebrated later. So in a way, I kind of did, you know, discover her in my way. But I just remember reading that book and just being, just being left breathless by the prose. I mean, it was just stunning. I had never read anything that beautiful. And I had read some great, I mean, I, you know, I had good English teachers in Atlanta public schools, and we read some, you know, I was in AP English, so we read some actual good work. But we hadn't read Toni Morrison, and I remember reading her work and just being just literally blown away, like just, I mean, just amazed, I mean, just breathless from it. And so uh, she remains one of my favorite writers. Um, and I wrote a biography of Zora Neale Hurston, spent six years researching and writing her life. And I had a similar feeling of overwhelm and just beauty when I read her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, for the first time. And I didn't read that until later when I was in college because she was out of print and not taught in uh, high school, but later kind of has come back into the American canon. 
Um, so those are some of my writers. I'm working on a book with Alice Walker now that she was a writer who's very, one of the writers I was reading in high school early on and was really influential in terms of my own um, imagining of myself as a black woman writer from the South. She's from Eatonton where, you know, the Burr Rabbit stories originated. And, um, you know, I actually wrote a piece for Ms. Magazine several years ago called Looking for Alice, where I went to Eatonton, and there were all these Joel Chandler Harris <laughs> tributes, but no tributes to Alice Walker. They've changed that since then. But those are some of the writers who have meant a lot to me over my development as a writer and a, as a thinker. And, and finally, uh, think of it as sort of guiding stars. There's not just one. There's a pantheon of them, but the, there are certain ones that you go back to when you feel like you're running out of juice mm -hmm. and you want to be reminded of why you ever started writing in the first place. And those people, for me, I, I go get a good uh, man is hard to find, that short story. Uh, I, I get uh, Of Mice and Men. I love that book uh, by John Steinbeck. I get uh, Big Two-Hearted River. Uh, the Nick Adams uh, story by Ernest Hemingway about the traumatized veteran who comes home from war and he just goes fishing. And it's the most beautiful, peaceful, healing kind of uh, story. And every line feels like it came from Mount Sinai. You know, it, it, it just feels perfect. The Old Testament. There is more Old Testament in, in my writing than any other single thing. The ideas and the themes, it, it's just, you know, infested with that. Talk about the greatest story ever. That has got to be it. If I could write like any writer, and I try my best to and fail every single paragraph, uh, I think Ken Kesey. I love Cuckoo's Nest. I, I find that book an amazement. In every paragraph, there's something that I think I wish I could write like that. Every paragraph in that book. It's just surpassingly uh, great to me. It's not to everyone's taste, but, but it certainly you know, hits the spot for me. And maybe one other. Uh, I love the magical realists. Uh, that stuff really got on, into my skin in the 1970s, and I, it is always with me when I write. They, those guys are watching over the shoulders as I work. Right, that's it. I think we are done. Thank you very much for coming.